Well, good evening again, everyone. And thank you for participating in the Primary Care for All webinar series, which is made possible through a partnership with the National Center for Primary Care at Morehouse School of Medicine, the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, the Migrant Clinicians Network, Clinical Directors Network, and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. This partnership allows primarycareforall.org to serve as a resource for you clinicians of the National Health Service Corps who serve the underserved. What well, tonight's presentation is entitled, Small Idea, Big Results. And it will help you, the clinician, discover how to lead a clinical imp performance improvement project in your clinic. CME um, credit has been applied for through the AAFP, and the status is pending for one hour of Category 1 credit. Well, our distinguished presenters are Drs. Prasharon Dixon and Carolyn Kurgerson from the Coastal Family Health Center, which is a 13-site FQHC that serves six counties in the southern Mississippi area. Dr. Dixon earned her medical degree from the Morehouse School of Medicine here in Atlanta, and she did her residency at the Emory University Hospitals. She currently serves as a medical director there at Coastal Family Health and also spends a great deal of her time being a local and national advocate for the children of Mississippi as well as their families. Dr. Kurgerson is a staff MD who has spent her career in pediatric primary care and public health in the, greater, in the great state of Mississippi. She's a graduate of the Louisiana State University School of Medicine in Shreveport, and she trained at the Sacred Heart Children's Hospital in Pensacola, Florida. Well, today's presentation will be divided into two sections. We're going to open with Dr. Dixon, who will give us some background information. At that point, then Dr. Um, Kurgerson will come in. Once Dr. Kurgerson joins us, then you are free to type your questions and your comments into the Q&A box, which you will see at the left-hand corner of your screen, and send them in, and they will answer your questions throughout the presentation. Phew. So, ladies and gentlemen, with all of that said, let's welcome Drs. Dixon and Kurgerson. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I think I have control of this now. Uh, we're honored to be here with you this evening to uh, talk with you a little bit about uh, how you can start projects in your community health center that will be very helpful to not only your patients, but to you as providers. And so this is entitled Small Idea, Big Results, Equipping Providers to Lead Quality Improvement Projects. You know, over the last two decades, we've seen a lot of increase in quality care initiatives across the country. Um, there have been lots of advances in medicine and in technology, but we have found that the healthcare sector has been very slow in moving on these uh, performance measures that are designed to make sure that the patients we care for every day are getting the best care. And so we are seeing a big, big move lately to make sure that we are on top of those things, especially in community health centers, uh, where the government is supplying us with some of the funding that uh, we have to take care of our patients and are expecting us to have outstanding results for those patients we serve. So let's get started. Um, this is our disclosure statement, uh, Dr. Kirkison and I. And both have no financial or other relationships with the manufacturer or any commercial services discussed in this educational activity. So our agenda tonight, we will start with just a little definition of quality health, and then we'll review the basic methodologies that are used to uh, start quality projects in your community centers or in your offices. And we will review an actual quality improvement project that we implement here at Coastal Family Health Center and actually was uh, initiated and run by Dr. Kurgensen as the provider champion. And then we'll talk a little bit about the role of providers in quality initiatives. So as I said, for the last two decades, we've just seen a real big push in how we will, as a, as a profession, provide quality care for our patients that 
is measurable. And that's the key word now, measurable. Making sure that the care that we're giving patients really does um, take care of them and that we are doing just what the U.S. Agency for Healthcare and Research and Quality stated, which is doing the right thing at the right time, in the right way, for the right person, and having the best possible results. We have found that there are a significant number of deaths occurring due to medical errors. And in a, a paper or research project done by the Institute of Medicine in 2008 called To Air is Human, we found astounding numbers, 44,000 to 98,000 American deaths and hospital errors accounting for 5 to 8, uh, becoming the 5th to 8th leading cause of death of patients just due to medical errors. Uh, it was astounding to really find out that hospitalized patients are subject to more than one medication error a day. So this really uh, pushed us into an era now where quality is expected. And everyone wants to see that we are, are doing projects that allow us to make sure that our patients receive the best of care. So let's talk a little bit about what methodologies are out there in terms of how we lead these quality projects in our, our centers. We'll hear talk of these three types of methodologies, one called Lean, uh, the second called Six Sigma, and the other called PDSA Cycle, or the Plan, Do, Study, Act. When we talk about Lean, this is actually a methodology that allows us to basically get rid of waste. That is actually the, the, the whole um, concept of Lean. Uh, this was actually started by the Toyota Motor Corporation in the 1950s. And basically what they said was we need to get rid of the waste that's in our process so that we can make the best vehicle for our clients in the most efficient way. And this concept is now traveling throughout even healthcare. Uh, when I received my master's in uh, uh, business administration from the Physician Executive MBA program in Knoxville, Tennessee, um, this was one of the primary methodologies that we looked at. What happened at Toyota to make Toyota great? And how can we use that same concept in healthcare? And basically, it is to get rid of waste remove non-value-added activities for what we are doing for our patients. The second concept is called Six Sigma. And this is actually a statistical measure. Uh, it really is a, a detail, detailed measure of how we decrease process variation, how we reduce cost, and how we go about eliminating defects in our system. And so, you know, while that sounds like a lot of big words, it really is the small things. And you're going to see that basically in the process that we'll tell you about in just a few minutes. But if you were to lead a Six Sigma process in your community health center, then what you would be doing is just looking at what is it that's causing um, variation in your system. Is it that you don't have any signs leading to your lab where you're having to take uh, a nurse to travel down the hall to take your patient there, which causes you to have uh, a, a backlog in your patient care because you are taking her away from doing something that's adding value to the system. Or you are allowing your patient to wander around and not get to that lab as quickly as possible. Um, by doing those kind of things, of course, you reduce the number of patients who are going to be able to come in because your nurse is no longer there, which affects your cost. And also, you're trying to find ways to eliminate defects that cause a problem in your system. As if, you know, if you're looking at a patient going to that same lab where the lab has not received the information about the actual uh, lab test, uh, you want to make sure that that information gets there first so that there's no confusion about what your patient is to receive. So these are just different things that you will see in a Six Sigma event that help to improve things in your community health center. We're going to talk more, though, 
about the PDSA cycle because this is the most common approach for rapid cycle improvement in healthcare. And probably it's the easiest because it is a trial and learning system, which basically means you suggest a way to improve something and then you test it and you do your test on small scale before you move it to uh, changes in your whole entire system. So trial and error. And it really follows this simple sequence of four repetitive steps. That is that you will make a plan and then you'll do something and then you'll study what you did and then based on what you did You'll find out what was good, what was bad, act on that, and then start the process again until you've uh, made sure you've perfected it. Again, you do this on a small scale, and then once you have it perfected, then you're able to expand that across a system. And for a place like Coastal Family Health Center, where we have 13 different sites, this plan and this model works excellently. And we found that out as we did our own improvement process as it relates to immunizations. The PDS cycle has these four aims. You have to set a focused aim, clearly articulate your time frames, and then you identify the measurable goals at the start of the project to make sure that you're able to move through that four, um, that four, the four processes of the model. So let's see. We will now take a little look at a cl clinical performance improvement project done at Coastal Family Health Center. Uh, and this was again around immunizations. And I will tell you any clinical performance improvement project starts with a provider champion. And so I'd like to introduce again Dr. Carolyn Kurgison, who was our provider champion on our immunization project. Dr. Kurgison? Dr. Dixon, while we're waiting for her to, okay. I think she lost her connection and came back up. Can you turn down your microphone volume? If you click up top yes. at the microphone, there's something that says adjust my Is that better? Okay, sorry about that if I blew anybody out there. Okay, so Dr. Kirkison, welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. We can um, hear you. Can you hear me? So uh, I was sharing, I was right. sharing just can you a little go bit about the different methodologies of a quality or qual the methodologies that are out there for leading quality projects and that the one that we used was the PDSA, which was to ask a question and then go about a, a simple process for figuring out what to do next. So, Dr. Kirkison, share if you can right. share with the guests what you did. I sure will. Can you go back two slides, though? Back to the title page. Um, in December of 2010, I was um, privileged to go to the annual conference for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, as a scholarship winner. And the donor of the scholarship was is a lady who um, is a mother of a child who died at the age of 11 years in a hospital due to errors. And so when she gives scholarships to this conference, she's looking for a pediatrician who serves uh, the vulnerable and underserved population, which is what Coastal Family Health does. And she's looking for someone with a passion for safety and for quality improvement. So I thought, well, that's me. I think I should apply for this. And so I was delighted to um, receive the scholarship and attend the conference. Um, this was the first time I had been to any sort of conference about quality improvement and, and safety, and it was quite the eye-opener. Um, and I came away from that thinking, what do I need to do? How am I going to take this knowledge back to my uh, organization, which is a series of 13 clinics in South Mississippi, and what project can I be the champion of to improve um, quality um, in some measurable way? I'll go on to the next slide. 
um, so I decided that in pediatrics, um, the greatest risk for errors is definitely in immunizations. Um, we, we keep an enormous inventory of immunizations in our refrigerator. Um, we have many, many brands. The packages might look alike. Um, similar products don't have the same age indication. They don't have the same dosing schedule. Some brands are interchangeable. Some brands are not. Um, at one time, I counted in our refrigerator that we had eight different products that had the word tetanus written on the box. And so the potential for error is enormous. Um, and it was our observation that when PRN nurses um, worked for us, well, first of all, they didn't want to work for us. They didn't want to work for the pediatricians because they were very, very frightened of making an error. Um, even, even people who were very familiar with the process um, could sometimes make errors because there was just, there was just too much to choose from. Um, couple that with the fact that we are an FQHC, so we have these UDS measures that we have to meet, and one of which is the measure of um, our patient's immunization rates at the age of two years. Um, at the age of two years, um, if they're on schedule, the earliest they can complete their primary immunization series is the age of 18 months. This takes uh, as many as 10 different vaccines and as many as 26 different doses, depending on if you use combinations or if you don't. Um, the earliest you can get them complete is 18 months. Um, we, our measure occurs at the child's second birthday. So if we're not up to date at 18 months, we only have six months to get caught up. So it's important to stay on schedule. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to keep our immunization rates up and reduce the um, potential for errors? Um, as I talked with the people and my coworkers, I gradually came to realize that all the providers and all the nurses um, knew something about immunization delivery and the immunization schedule and the catch-up schedule and the storage and handling um, and the actual administration. But there was no one group that knew all the aspects of it. And that communication between the two groups was lacking. Um, so our goal was to. Um, increase our knowledge and comfort level of all of our staff. And I gradually came to realize that we should not assume that all of your staff starts with the same basic set of knowledge. So we started at the very, very beginning with, um, with just really, really basic um, increase in knowledge. So. Um, Oh, also including um, ordering of vaccines. There was um, nurses order vaccines, physicians use the vaccines, and there was a big disconnect in knowledge between the two groups, which brands do you order, which brands are you going to use. So this started at a, um, an administrative meeting that I was at, a, a committee, a quality improvement committee within Coastal Family Health. And I, I shared um, my experience at the IHI conference and, and told them, well, I really thought I should implement a quality improvement project in Coastal Family Health and that I thought it should center around immunization. And my original idea was to create a standardized labeling system for our vaccines. I was going to create labels to use within the refrigerators, label each product that was in the refrigerator. And the more I talked about this with the um, committee, they, they liked that idea. But they all said, well, why would you limit the scope of your project to that? There's a lot more to vaccines than just the labeling. Um, there's ordering. There's administration. There's handling. Um, there's record keeping. There's recall systems. So gradually, piece by piece, the project kept, uh, kept increasing in size. Um, what happened was that every, um, every group of people added to this project. Um, and the more we increased 
the knowledge level of our staff, the less the anxiety and the greater the workflow um, and a greater comfort level. Therefore, a greater immunization rate would occur because people could do their job quickly uh, without worrying about errors. So, um, so when we um, when we created the labeling system, um, the labels are as big as can fit in the space that is allowed. Like every, everyone's refrigerator was not the same size. So I made labels of all different sizes so that you could fit the biggest label you could fit in your refrigerator with your particular inventory. Okay? The labels start with big bold print capital letters that include uh, the name of the vaccine, the, the antigen type, any brand names, um, official abbreviations. It turns out each vaccine has an official abbreviation, and I didn't know that ahead of time. Um, and then in smaller print underneath, the age range for each vaccine. If uh, the vaccine is a series, how many doses are in the series? If um, there's something special about the route of administration, for instance, most vaccines are delivered IM, but there are some that are delivered only subcutaneous or oral or intranasal. That's written on the labels as well. Um, there are products that are combination vaccines. Um, don't assume that your staff or anyone knows exactly what's in any of those combination vaccines. So we included the list of components for each of these vaccines on our, li on our labeling system. Um, vaccines that are live virus vaccines, that's indicated on the label because live virus vaccines either need to be all given on the same day or they need to be given at least a month apart. Um, some vaccines are supplied in pre-filled syringes and some are in multi-dose vials. Don't assume everyone knows what the dose is in these multi-dose vials. We spell that out on the labels as well. Um, if for some vaccines, um, different brands are interchangeable. For instance, um, for the DTAP vet vaccine, there's Infanrix, there's Daptacel, there's Tripedia. Those are interchangeable. So all of those are on the same label, indicating that they are in interchangeable. Um, also with hepatitis A, there's Havrix and Vaqua. Those are interchangeable. But some uh, vaccines are not interchangeable. For instance, um, the rotavirus, the rototech versus the rotorix, they're not the same and not interchangeable. The uh, human papillomavirus, the Gardasil and the Cervarix are not interchangeable. So all of these things are listed on the labels. The label is designed to be like the last, the last stop, the last place where you can prevent an error from happening. Everything that's important to know about that vaccine is right there in the refrigerator when you choose it to make you think one more time, is this the right product for this child at this particular time? Uh, so, all right, they started with the labeling system, then we had to implement it. So, I went, started with the administrative meeting, then um, I went to each clinic in our, in our system, clinic to clinic to clinic, to introduce the project. Um, a big, big benefit of this was that I got to know all the people at all the clinics. Our organization is large and covers a big, big geographic area, um, and we don't all know each other. Um, we have occasional meetings all together, but it's not that easy to meet people when there's 200 people in the same room at the same time. So this way, I got to visit them in their work setting and get to know them one at a time. Um, I went to each clinic to talk with the pediatric nurses, um, the nurse supervisors. Uh, I met with all the pediatricians collectively at a pediatric provider meeting. Um, and what happened was that at each clinic, it turns out everyone 
had the same sort of um, feeling of unease that I had about the delivery of administrations, the potential for errors. And everyone had some experience that uh, about an error or a potential for error. And everyone shared something to improve this project. And I took every single idea and incorporated it into the, um, into the project. Um, I, and the quality of the project and the scope of the project kept increasing with each clinic that I visited. Um, um, so here's, um, here's a photo of our labeling system. Um, we've also, um, like I said, not everyone's refrigerator is the same size, so not everyone can arrange it exactly the same way. But we've, we've encouraged people to arrange the vaccines by age group. We, uh, the ones that are for infants and preschool children, we keep at the top of the refrigerator. Um, the ones that are for adolescents, we try to keep in the middle. And our enormous flu vaccine uh, inventory, when we get that, that stays at the bottom. So the bold print um, is the names of the vaccines and the official abbreviation. And then the small print underneath is all the particulars. Other things you'll see in this one that this particular clinic wanted to highlight uh, the vaccines just to make it even sharper for them. So everyone took some ownership of uh, their refrigerator. Yeah, so this particular clinic decided to highlight um, the particular name that they used among themselves when they, were di when they were discussing a vaccine. The name that they used to, d to describe it was what they highlighted on the, um, on the label. Like, can't miss it. It's right here in your face when you open the refrigerator. So the project expanded. Um, and it resulted in the need to create a resource manual. So I created a binder full of resource materials for each and every clinic, for each and every provider, um, using materials that are available to the public from two, two, mostly two websites, the Center for Disease Control, cdc.org, and the Immunization Action Coalition. Each of them have excellent, excellent resource materials that are available online. Now, just because they're available online doesn't mean that your staff can find them online when they really need to, when they need them. So we we found that it was definitely um, advantageous to have these printed out, to have them in a manual. Some things are just in the resource manual. Some things are printed and actually posted on each refrigerator. And some of the reference materials are printed and kept at the desk of each provider that provides immunizations. So um, this shows the refrigerators. Um, since these photos were taken, we've, we've even expanded the things that are, um, that are posted on the refrigerators. One of the ideas that we incorporated um, from someone in the clinic was to um, have the things that we post in colored paper because it's just easier to see at a glance when the reference material you're looking at is a certain color. Because the nurses um, sometimes have to work at different clinics. And they, they wanted everything to look the same when they go from clinic to clinic. So we used yellow paper to um, use the most current immunization schedule, the 2011 schedule. There's one for infants. There's one for adolescents. And there's one for adults. Those are posted. Um, then we decided to use uh, pink paper for other reference materials. For instance, um, the catch-up schedule is posted, what to do when you're behind. Um, vaccine storage and handling, um, which vaccines go in the refrigerator, which ones go in the freezer, what temperature should they be kept at. Um, there was another one that was a request to go on the refrigerator. Vaccines that require diluents. Um, how do you use them? How do you mix the diluent? How long can the vaccine be held before administering to the patient after the diluent's been added? 
uh, what's the name of the diluent? Does it come in the same box with the vaccine? Is it stored separately? Do the diluents need to be in the refrigerator or not? Um, We also have uh, warning labels, what to do in case of power failure, um, what to do in case of equipment failure, like your refrigerator breaks and you come in and you find that it's warm, what to do then. Um, and what to do for us uh, living on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, hurricanes are always a threat, uh, what to do in, in the event that, of a hurricane uh, coming our way. By making those papers different colors, it allow the supervising nurses uh, a, a quick look at their refrigerators in their different areas to make sure that the nurses had the proper things posted. And so it was a, it, it was a way to, to really monitor if um, the, the appropriate paperwork was visible on the refrigerator without having to actually go up and look at each one individually. Um, other things that I included in our reference manual, um, sort of the first thing I started with was a list of websites where I found the information so that to empower people to find it themselves if they need to. The next thing was, uh, turns out I didn't know this, that each state has a law um, determining who is allowed to bring a child to a medical clinic for health care. Um, before this project started, each of us had our own ideas about who was allowed to bring a child and um, most of us were very uneasy if it wasn't an actual parent with the child. Turns out in the state of Mississippi, um, any adult who's interested in the welfare of the child is allowed to bring the child to, an, uh, to a doctor's visit and therefore this child, you, you are required to treat this child including vaccines. Um, because his rights for this are protected by law. Um, doesn't matter whether he's with his mother, his father, his grandmother, or his dad's new girlfriend, or the next door neighbor. Um, that that's not a reason not to immunize a child. And that was, um, that was an eye opener for almost everyone, I think, when we discovered that. So putting the actual state law of Mississippi in the front of the, the binder was, uh, was the start. Um, basically, the binder um, addresses every, per, every perceived barrier to immunization that could be in the minds of the providers. You know, as I talk to each provider, well, what is it that stops you from immunizing children? And they would share something with me. And so then I would put information in the binder, in the race reference binder, about, about addressing that particular um, fear. Then it... Um, then we had to um, start at the beginning and, and not assume that everyone who delivers vaccines has the same um, background of information. So we got um, a training video which um, I bought from the CDC website and um, um, it's, called, um, it's called Immunization Techniques. Um, best, wait, let me it called? Oh, Immunization Techniques, Best Practices with Infants, Children, and Adolescents. And it's very basic, um, but it's excellent. Um, it's, it's telling you everything that you need to know and doing it at the same time. Um, and we use it, we've used it to, even for the most experienced nurse, everyone's had to, you know, watch this video, it takes only 25 minutes to watch, and then it'll be part of the training for all nurses coming in. Um, then another training material we found was a website that's put up by the Medical University of South Carolina. It's called TIDE, which is Teaching Immunization Delivery and Evaluation. Um, the nurses and the medical providers have done the training modules on this website. It's actually quite fun to do. It's, it's an interactive training and the part of the website that I like the most is the um, storage and handling teaching module. It's little vignettes, um, 
with links to reference materials, ask you questions as you go along. If you get the answer incorrect, it goes back and reviews what you did wrong and brings you to the reference material, um, you know, showing the, the evidence for their practice. Um, everyone has enjoyed doing that. So, um, the next the next step is going to is um, follow up visits at each of the clinics. Um, I've been to most of the clinics one time. I've been to all of the clinics one time. I've been to most of the clinics two times. Um, and it will take probably another visit to everybody this calendar year to get everybody on board um, to address everyone's concerns and everyone's questions. And like I said, the, the value of going back is that every, every individual, every group of people I talk to adds something to the project that is of value. Um, um, another thing I've done is, um, you know, the, we, the success of this project is going to be determined by our actual immunization rates and our UDS report, which is done at the end of this year. We'll compare this year to last year's. Um, and I've given the providers and the nurses um, a way to kind of follow their progress. Um, we have a, a report, a reporting system on our uh, electronic medical record program that most of us did not know how to use. And I kind of stumbled upon that and discovered how to do searches for different patient groups to determine if they're up to date on their immunizations. Like once a child has their 12-month-old shots, how to decide if they've had the full set to complete their primary series. Once a child turns four years old, how to determine if they've had their school-age shots, things like that. Um, and so this, this will, um, these, these reports and these sort of updates of your status need to be done probably once a month um, to keep to keep up to date so that your patients aren't falling behind. We've also pulled the, our clerical staff into this project too, so they're part of the champions to improve our immunization rates um, and be a part of it. By, they are the ones who keep um, spreadsheets and have our recall system that we've developed. Every clinic has a recall system with the patients listed on spreadsheets. As we see each patient, our nurses communicate with the clerical staff about when this patient is due back in the clinic for a vaccine. If they don't come in in a timely manner, then a postcard or a phone call or both are sent out to them. And so everyone's part of the team the to keep our immunization rates high. Implementation. OK. Um, the idea came in December of 2010. While I was at this conference, um, I went to the administrative meeting where I first um, suggested the project in January of 2011 and shared my thoughts with the project for the project with the committee there. Um, and they were very, very encouraging. And so I started developing my lab labeling system and started doing my research, which uh, took a while to do the research about what needs to be on the labels and um, perusing websites, gathering information. So in February, I went back to the same committee meeting and uh, gave them my updates on how my project was going along. And at that point, they said, you need to expand the scope of your project. So more research, back to the drawing board. Um, by March, I started visiting the clinics one at a time. Um, and I was just shocked at how such excellent suggestions I got at each visit. So my clinic visits took probably the entire month of March and April and into May. Oh, I forgot. I, I, used, um, I used our clinic um, as sort of the trial balloon, um, set up the project within our clinic, got our nurses trained, watched the video, developed the reference manual, decided the postings on the refrigerator, the postings at each provider's desk. And then from there, then I, then I branched out into the other clinics. So March, April into May, um, I did that. Um, started second visits probably in June. Um, and we'll visit again before the end of the year. 
also along the way, many of the reference materials that I've used um, get updated by the Center for Disease Control or the Immunization Action Coalition. And that's my responsibility to keep updating the reference manuals with the most current um, six months to a year most current materials to complete. Oh. So it, it is not unusual for your projects to take a little while. Um, and, and certainly this was pretty fast considering the additional items that were added to what started off as just a labeling project that expanded so quickly. Um, there is a second question here about how did we handle the pushback from staff who were reluctant to change. And I don't know, Carolyn, you may, uh, I, you went to all the individual practices, but I found no pushback. Everyone was excited about this project and um, really understood why we needed to do it because there, there was a lot of fear around giving immunizations, especially if you were not a nurse who did pediatrics all the time, and fear from the pediatric providers of PRN nurses or adult nurses who would be working with them at the time uh, giving these immunizations. So I don't know, what was your experience? Um, I agree. I, I didn't have um, much reluctance. I will have to say, though, that the whole project um, involves sort of a change of mindset because um, many of the providers did not have a mindset that they were always looking for an opportunity to vaccinate children, um, which is a, a main goal of the CDC. Don't miss, don't miss an opportunity to vaccinate children. And that requires a high degree of awareness. It requires um, keeping your electronic medical records up to date with the child's vaccines. It requires checking the state immunization registry. Um, but now I think we have everyone on board with that, that every patient who comes into the clinic has their immunization record checked while they are there or before they're there. Quite a number of the nurses um, check everybody's vaccine record at the start of the day or at the end of the previous day, look and see who's coming in tomorrow and check everybody's record and make a list of for each child, you know, what do they need? Is it time for this? Is it time for that? Um, it was mostly getting people to, to think in terms of vaccines like that. Look for a reason to vaccinate instead of always trying to find a reason not to. Um, dispelling myths about um, you know, this child does have a cold, but it's okay. He needs his vaccines. Um, those kinds of things. A, a big part of, um, I forgot to mention this when I talked about uh, what was included in the reference manual. Fear from the provider's standpoint was, was definitely something that, that I uncovered. Everyone was afraid of, of injuring a child by choosing the wrong product or by vaccinating them during a time when it would hurt them or by giving them something that was contraindicated. So I found reference materials on those same websites um, that were summaries of contraindications, summaries of precautions, and things that are just plain myths that we don't need to worry about. Um, put that in the reference manual, put a copy of that at each provider's desk. So um, and that helped a lot. That I think a um, lot of that dispelled a lot of fear. Offshoots from what you really intended on doing. You, we intended on you know finding a labeling system that could work across the board, um, but in the process, we found all these uh, other wonderful things that happened for us. You know, more immunizations being done, less fear about it, uh, more awareness of, of the need to immunize the children. Um, my own personal story is having worked with a, a nurse who was used to doing adult care, and it was a nurse that I had worked with before. And um, frankly, she was frightened of working with me, and. And when I saw who I was working with, and that she's, she's not a bad nurse, she is an adult provider. And um, working once before, I had turned patients away who needed immunizations. And this time, it was total opposite. When she saw that refrigerator and saw how well labeled it was, and um, you know, it just took the pain out of it uh, for both of us. When we saw that, she had no, no reservations about giving the immunizations, and I had no reservations about her doing it. So that was just a testament to this wonderful project and, and the outcomes that we had from it. I know it sounds like a lot, it was a lot of work, 
but it was, I, I think um, I, I can speak to our position champion, how important that is that whoever takes on the project, that you take on a project that you're very interested in and one that you know will make a, a clear um, improvement in the quality of care that you all are giving and you'll find yourself getting wrapped up in it. I think uh, Carolyn kept doing things uh, um, and not because she was pushed but because the more you do, the more you find and more you find, the better the project is. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, my my discovery was that the nurses knew a lot about immunizations. The physicians knew a lot about immunizations, but nobody knew everything that needed to be known about the delivery and the ordering and the administration and the storage and handling um, and the indications. Nobody knew everything, including myself. And um, my knowledge level increased 300% easily with this project and I, and I was happy to share that with other people and other people were very excited that their knowledge level was increasing too in a painless manner. Um, the other thing that happened that, that I think is the, the part of my project that I am the proudest of is that um, sort of a change in climate has happened within our organization that, that I perceive anyway. Prior to this, um, I was surprised to discover that everyone had reservations about the same things I had reservations about, but no one shared their reservations. Like I said, our, our clinic is, um, our organization is large, and very few of us have been to all the clinics, and very few of us know everyone who works in all the clinics. Um, and although we have an email system that's easy to use, uh, and a telephone system that's easy to use, you're not likely to contact someone that you don't know to ask a question or to um, to reveal your ignorance, basically. You're not likely to do that. Um, and as I went from place to place, basically what I did was create a safe environment, uh, a non-judgmental environment, an encouraging environment to get our staff to share with me. What, what's your problems here? Um, what are your concerns? What are your successes? Do you have some ideas that work for you that you can share with everyone? And once that started happening, um, I found enormous increase in communication. Um, and people that I do not know and people that I have not met now call me and ask my advice about things related to this project. Um, I'm, I'm just so pleased with that. I can't even tell you. And I think that what I've foresee as the ultimate um, success of this project will be that another member of our organization is going to take a on a project about, that um, is important to them problem, and you will we'll have another champion with another goal. Improved, we recommend leading it, should the person lead it themselves or should they designate someone else to lead it. And I, I, I see this as an opportunity uh, on both ends. Um, we have a growing uh, well, I, I think a, a really strong quality improvement team here at Coastal Family Health Center. And you should find that at most community health centers now, if you don't have one, one will be started soon because of all of the requirements that we have now around quality. And so we've tried to make everything a team effort. Um, while Dr. Kirkison was our, our champion on this, her nurse was just as much of a champion in, in helping her with this project, um, certainly bouncing information off of the quality team and then just all the other folks who, who, who uh, gave information to Dr. Kirkison to make this project bigger. Uh, but there are going to be projects that require several people to be involved and have different parts. And then there are other ones that may be smaller that only require one person. Um, so it really is pretty fluid. I think it, uh, you may be able to find someone who you know has a special interest. Now for me, um, we, just what Dr. Kirkison said has already happened uh, where we have one of our interpreters, a Spanish interpreter. Well, we lost one of our interpreters and she's the only interpreter in one of our clinics. And so her idea was to take our English form, registration form, and add the bilingual words to it so that our Spanish-speaking patients could start registering without her so that, you know, it, it, it actually made things faster. 
that is an improvement project. She found something that needed to be done that would make things better for the patient and make their, their ability to get through the system faster. That led to our Vietnamese uh, um, interpreter doing the same thing. So uh, it's contagious. This quality thing is actually very contagious. And uh, there's a question here about whether we're planning on publishing the results, Dr. Kurgison. <laughs> but I've talked about it with her a little bit, and uh, I think that's when we get some data. Um, uh, I don't have plans at the moment. <laughs> our ultimate goal of having our um, rates go up and also looking at what it did for our staff. That's all great, great uh, data to um, publish about how improvement processes actually improve not only um, patient care, but improve the quality of the services that the, the providers and the staff are giving. So, oh yes. I would I would be remiss if I didn't mention my nurse Sarah, who is just the most the most awesome pediatric nurse ever, um, and she was definitely just so helpful with this project, um, and encouraged the other nurses to follow her model. Which now her model is that she looks up everyone's immunization um, records, she chases them down, whether it's on paper, on electronic medical records, on the registry. She. Um, She's very knowledgeable about the schedule. She knows what to do when the child's behind. She knows what to do when the schedule's not where it should be. And as she is taking the patient's vital signs and taking their initial uh, chief complaint, she brings the topic of immunizations up with the child's parents um, and almost always um, gets them to agree to immunize the child during that visit. We have a way between ourselves that she communicates this to me, um, that she's gotten these people to agree to whichever.